Good afternoon. We are here at the European Parliament talking today about artificial intelligence in the context of European politics. Our guest today is Mr. Dragos Sudorakia, Member of Parliament and the Renew Europe Group, Chair of the Special Committee on Artificial Intelligence in the Digital Age. The questions I'm about to ask came from citizens concerned with AI, human rights and European leadership. Mr. Tudorakia, the first question is, what is the state of the transatlantic collaboration between EU and US on digital issues? And what do you believe are the necessary next steps? Well, I think from the start of the relaunch, let's say, of the transatlantic dialogue after the election of the Biden administration, uh, digital issues have come very quickly at the forefront of the dialogue and the uh, steps that were foreseen both on the side of the European Union but also on the side of the American administration as though that have to be uh, discussed with priority. Uh, we as Europeans made a proposal for the Trade and Technology Council and that was supposed to be one of the landmarks and is still supposed to be one of the landmarks of this dialogue. I think the reasons why that is the case are evident. I think on both sides of the Atlantic, we both recognize the impact of digital transformation for our societies, economies, uh, for our democracies. And therefore, I think it's only evident and, 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 and normal uh, that we are dealing with these things. And plus, they have the potential to be, let's say, politically a point of convergence much quicker, uh, much, much smoother than many of the other points. Uh, as I think we all know, on the 29th, uh, the TTC uh, is scheduled. Uh, we had the irritants in the relationship uh, over the last few weeks. Uh, and then I think many, and as it's known, many have thought, uh, is the TTC still on or not? I think it's important that we have this conversation. Um, I think it's important for both sides. Uh, it's also a sign of leadership for the rest of the world because we are in a global setting here. And I think many look towards the uh, European Union and towards the US and towards this transatlantic bond to provide that, that, that sign of leadership to put forward uh, the key, uh, the key um, hallmarks for how we're going to define the rulebook of the digital age uh, at the global scene. Thank you. In terms of geopolitics, AI has become an area of strategic importance in view of its potential to help solve a multitude of global societal challenges, what are the most obvious and urgent challenges that AI can solve at international level? Well, I think it's evident we have to start with economics. Um, it's technology and AI is a technology and like many other cutting edge technologies is driving now the current industrial revolution. And therefore, we have to understand that AI has that potential to actually power up our development, to power up our economies uh, and everything from production chains to supply chains to how we use smarter utilities, even to how we green our economies. A lot of that has to do with how we're going to harness the potential of artificial intelligence, of how we're going to to inject these new uh, technologies into, into how we do economics and how we do uh, everything from production to, to services. Uh, so clearly the first conversation, the first global challenge, let's say, in how we, we deal with artificial intelligence is, is economical. The second one I would say is societal. Uh, artificial intelligence and in general, the digital transformation that we're going through does have a tremendous impact on society on how we interact with each other as human beings, how we interact with, with the service providers, how we interact with the administration, with the state itself. So clearly, I think uh, the way we're going to set up the rules for artificial intelligence development uh, and for this digital tra transformation is going to impact whether the society of tomorrow, the digital society of tomorrow, is going to be fairer than the physical society of today. And I think this is one of the challenges that at the global level we have to address as well as a second very important point also on the societal aspect is, is inequality and whether AI is going to be a technology that will deeper the current inequalities in our society or is going to actually do better uh, in, in allowing uh, everyone to catch up and be there uh, to harness and to reap the benefits of artificial intelligence. The third challenge and the third theme is indeed the impact on democracies. Artificial intelligence as a neutral technology does have an impact on, on our democratic fiber, on our democratic setup. We can see the impact of fake news, we can see the impact of 
hybrid attacks on our democracies, and all that can be powered up by artificial intelligence used for the bad, if I can call it this way. And therefore, again, how we set the rules uh, for developing artificial intelligence in the European Union, but also at the global level, is going to impact also how our democracies are going to look like in five years, in ten years' time. And last but not least, defence and technology have always been uh, a very uh, clear and direct uh, blend. Uh, the evolution of technologies has changed uh, warfare and defence, and therefore it also has, at the global level, an impact on how defence uh, is going to look like. And there, again, as Europeans, and I hope also with other like-minded global actors out there, speaking of transatlantic, uh, we have an interest in setting uh, the rule book for how AI is going to be used in defense. So all of these make global challenges that I think we have to, to uh, factor into our uh, political thinking and also the way we're going to set up policies and legislation from, from here on. EU aims to push for a globally competitive AI framework that is human-centric, human rights-based and respects EU values. Could you tell us more on the differences between EU and China and US regarding the regulation of AI? I think this is where uh, the EU can really set itself apart from, from the other global players out there. You mentioned China and the US and clearly they are the, uh, they are the players uh, on the scene right now. Um, and I think it can, it can make a difference uh, with what we are doing right now, which is trying to write the rules for how we develop artificial intelligence and how we roll it into our lives and into our economies. Um, and I think the middle way and the human-centric way which, which the European Union is trying to, to uh, take is the right one. If we look at the Chinese model, uh, their artificial intelligence has been very much driven by the state and very much with the interests of the state in mind in how it controls society, in how it controls economies. And clearly it is based on an understanding of values and of human individuality, which is fundamentally different than how we understand these things. If you look at the US model, there uh, the, the companies have been the ones driving, basically, the platforms have been the ones driving how AI and how this technology has, has been developing without any attempt to actually set any boundaries, particularly when it comes to the impact on, on human interests and, and fundamental rights. And I think this is where EU comes in uh, right at the, at the heart or at the, at the middle of this divide, in fact, by saying this technology is one that can actually help our lives, it can help our economies, but we need to, to, to set rules to make it ethical to make it uh, compatible with how we understand these values, with how we understand the need to protect the interests and the rights of our citizens. And I think that by doing that, and by being the first at, at writing down these rules and at taking this approach to write the rules, I think we have, an, we have right now the potential to actually influence also what happens at the broader global scene when it comes to developing and, and writing rules for AI. And if you look at the fact that also, what I was saying earlier, at the very heart of the first dialogue that we have with the US as part of the TTC of the, of, of the, of the Trade and Technology Council is uh, AI, I think it clearly shows that the signal that we've given as European Union is a signal that other like-minded global players are taking very seriously because we are a big market and how we are setting the rules for entering and playing on this market for technology such as AI is inevitably going to also impact the behavior of companies, even outside uh, the European Union. And then clearly, I think there is an interest out there to, to look for regulatory convergence. And my hope and my anticipation is that, based also on, on discussions that we've had already with, with partners on the US side, we are going to aim for such regulatory convergence and, and hopefully we're also going to achieve it uh, rather soon. In addition to regulatory innovation, Europe has work to do in building greater capacities in digital skills and education, as well as gaps in funding for research and development, both of which remain structural challenges to building a European workforce, an entrepreneurial base equipped to harness the future of AI. How do you think we can speed up with developing digital skills and education? Well, I think clearly we need to put that at the very heart of our priorities. And um, listening to how the Commission understands uh, the evolution, the next steps over the coming years uh, for the digital decade, 
um, the framework in which we are now rolling the new policy on, on uh, digital development uh, at European level. I think uh, it is becoming evident that we are understanding the challenge of education uh, if we want indeed to, to uh, benefit and to make the digital transformation a success story for Europeans and also for European e e economy and, and society. Um, there is clearly now a deficit. There is a deficit in terms of, let's say, general digital education for all of us. Because if digital uh, is to be as important as we say it is, then all of us, all European citizens, need to be able to have the, the minimum skills to uptake the products of this digital transformation. Otherwise, uh, it's going to remain an empty shell. So, first and foremost, we need to understand that we need to, to, uh, to uh, broaden and to strengthen the base. Then. On top of that, we need the right expertise uh, in, our, in our students, in our children, um, in our young graduates, the right expertise to actually power up all that new economy based on digital and artificial intelligence. Uh, I know that the Commission is now making estimates as to what is right now the gap in the, in the labour force for this sort of expertise. And I think that by, by 2030, uh, at the current pace, uh, we would be reaching somewhere uh, between 12 and 13 million experts ready to be uh, engaging these digital, tra digital transformational economies. But the actual need is somewhere uh, around 20 uh, from estimates that the European Commission has put forward. So clearly, uh, we need to look at our education systems. And this is a challenge because we are still working with fragmented member state competence-based educational system. So we need to give the right impetus at also at European level so that the adaptations uh, necessary in the curricula uh, at the member state levels are done so that we are uh, capable of filling up that gap. And then once we do that, and presuming that we do that, we also need to look very carefully, and this touches upon the other point you were making, which is research and innovation, we need to look at how we make the European market uh, and the European research and innovation ecosystem attractive for talent. Because even now we are producing talent, but a lot of that talent disappears. A lot of that talent crosses the Atlantic, finds its way uh, and finds an easier way, maybe a better way, a more accessible way across the Atlantic in the US. And I think we need to structurally address this challenge. How do we retain talent here in Europe? And this has to do with the right uh, amount of financing that we put into research, into innovation, in how we support startups, how we support those bright boys and girls with bright ideas who need quick financing to basically turn their bright ideas into, into a startup. And even if we manage to secure that financing, and I think that if we look at this particular financial cycle, we have done clearly uh, fundamental steps in, in increasing the portfolios for digital uh, projects and for supporting our digital ecosystem. So that is already a good start and a good thing. But beyond that, we also need to invest again in raising the attractiveness also of our research and innovation environment. We need to build those beacons that can convince uh, talented engineers, talented developers to remain here in Europe because they would understand that what they do here matters. So um, uh, we need to invest on all of these fronts if we want to actually stay competitive and if we want that while we write the rules there is also someone afterwards who plays with those rules and then develops technology uh, to, to, better our, to better our economies and our societies. Thank you. Now um, let's see what are the perils of AI as seen by the regulators within EU and what are the immediate advantages of AI in economy, administration, etc.? Well, I think uh, the perils of AI are those perils that have been identified from the very beginning, both by the European Commission when it started preparing the current proposal, the AI Act, but also here in the European Parliament, also at national level, in the debates uh, in the national parliaments, and the debates in national governments. In fact, there has been a bit of a, an uprising, if I could call it this way, of, mm -hmm. of interest, of priority being given to how AI needs to be regulated because it needed to address those perils that you were mentioning. And I would start with these, with these elements that are affecting uh, society, that affect individual rights. That is why we have built up a proposal um, 
and an approach to, to regulating AI that is human-centric, because the greatest perils are there. Deepening uh, inequalities, deepening prejudices in society, uh, because if we allow AI to simply carry over prejudices that you can find in the way uh, data uh, sets or, or data streams uh, have been historically developed, uh, then basically we're not uh, allowing technology to, to make our lives mm -hmm. and our societies uh, better in the years to come. So um, these, let's say, societal, uh, human-related aspects are, I think, the greatest perils. Um, and that's something that with the new legislation uh, we are trying to address. Uh, beyond that are the, are the risks uh, linked to also missing out on the, on the potential benefits of this technology. And this is where we need to strike the right balance, while at the same time we write the rules and we try to confine the way we develop AI uh, so that we don't affect uh, our interests and, and our individual rights. At the same time, we have to make sure that we don't put so many boundaries and so many hurdles and so much of a burden on development that we are not actually allowing AI to help us grow. And we're not reaping those benefits uh, of AI that I was mentioning earlier. So I think finding that balance is something that is going to be very important for us as regulators when we're going to start negotiating to start engaging um, Council and European Parliament to, to finalize the, the negotiations of this text. What are the next steps of European AI after we have passed the AI Act? And how do we reap the benefits of AI at European level? Well, I would say as always with European legislation, there is a, uh, a challenge when you prepare it to make sure that it's well prepared. Uh, and then there is a challenge trying to find uh, the political compromise to have it adopted. But then the greater challenge uh, comes when you start implementing it. And I think um, in terms of next steps, once it is adopted for adoption, uh, I think we are now starting with the uh, negotiations uh, of, the, of the test itself. It's going to take some time because it's a very complex piece of legislation that I can anticipate will, uh, will take some time uh, preparing, negotiating. But once that is done, rolling it afterwards at member state level, at the ground level, um, making it easily understandable and applicable for all those in the real economy that are going to uh, develop artificial intelligence uh, and try to, to play by the new rules that we are setting up, that is going to be the big challenge. I think an additional, um, an additional hurdle that will not be easy to pass and where we have to pay particular attention is not to further fragment a market which we actually aim to consolidate. We all say that we need this digital single market to allow for the proper scale when it comes to uh, how we develop digital technologies and to allow European companies, European startups, European scale-ups to really benefit from the whole proportion of the EU market and then be up there competitive with those in the US, China or in other corners of the world. But to do that, we need to avoid fragmentation along the 27 different national markets. And that will be a, a, a fundamental challenge for how we're going to implement legislation because there is uh, quite a sizable part of implementation that is left for national regulators. So we will end up with 27 different national regulators that are going to meet in a European governance structure where they are meant to harmonize their practices, but it still leaves uh, 27 uh, different, uh, let's say, um, ecosystems. Um, and for all those uh, engineers, developers, companies, big or small, that will want to play out the entire European market, they will always have to be mindful of potential variations of interpretation and implementation uh, at member state level. And that is a challenge that we need to be very careful with, um, both in terms of how we are going to set up the rules. So I think that's something that we can still properly adjust when we are negotiating now the legislation and we, when we write down the rules, but also afterwards at national level when we're going to uh, prepare the implementation and start applying it in practice for, for again, for the real economy. Mr. Dragos Dorake, thank you. 
This being the last question and answer, thank you everybody for following us today. See you next time. Thank you.